Station, and I'm running on two hours. All right, welcome back to the Insights Podcast presented by Vantage Pro. Uh, I'm Duke DeYoung. With me, as always, Mr. Van Metchke, Hello. who apparently is running on fumes, so it'll be fun to see what we get out of him today. Yeah, it's going to be one of those times, you know. <laughs> Some people like me when I'm like this, when I'm like completely loopy. Others do not. So I think we'll see. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm undetermined so far. So <laughs> Sometimes it's fun and sometimes it's not fun. So it just depends on whether you're grumpy when you're sleep deprived or whether you're loopy. And I'll, I mean, loopy, I'll take that's an I'm more loopy than I'm grumpy. So we should be in good shape. I like it. I like it. Well, and the band is back together. We have a special guest and the specialist of special guests. We have Mike <laughs> Sessler's beard. Hello. I'm here. I like it. I know we, all these, uh, all these years of church tech weekly minus beard. So I'm, I'm expecting yeah. Like I'm expecting a high bar today. Well, and to be fair, we never did video with the uh, CTW podcast, so true. It was always uh, it was always audio only, and there was a good reason for that. <laughs> <laughs> we have voice. We have faces for radio, right? Uh, yeah, that's true. That's true. That See, is true. In, well, we, as you can tell, I'm not prepared for a video podcast based on my really cool background that I have here. That is an awesome background. <laughs> yeah. I will tell you what though, with, with this software though, if you get a, if you uh, get a green background, then I can put anything in you want. Oh, well, I could probably tweak the uh, white balance on my camera to make it green. No, that's probably true. <laughs> I like it. I don't know what it's going to do to you, but. Well, you know, you can put it, you can put me back later. Yeah. <laughs> we'll fix it in post. Yeah. I like exactly. it. That'd be fine. I like it. Fix very it cool. in post. Well, I we want to definitely be fixing this in post. So that's very true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there you go. Well, we wanted to get the band back together uh, a number of years ago, and, and this is relevant to our everyday world, but a number of years ago, we taught a class at uh, Philo conference. Um, this was uh, during the COVID era. I think I think they had their one of their largest attendances, but it was most it was all online or mostly online. Um, but we did a class called "How to Survive a Building Project Without Quitting Your Job," and uh, it seems like we're you, you know we're all on the integration side these days, um, and it seems like we keep running into folks who are pulling their hair out um, <laughs> trying to survive building projects. Uh, and we thought, you know, this this is still very relevant. Um, there's there's a lot of people. Execu it seems like executive pastors and tech directors, in particular, uh, get through these building projects, and often they're gone. Right? I mean, they're either just burnt out or uh, just had enough, and they take off. And so uh, that's kind of where this class was born out of. And we thought, you know, it's still fairly relevant. We we might want to go ahead and talk about this some more. Yeah, I think. I mean, this is probably not true anymore, but I, th I, I remember, uh, Mike, do you remember where that was, where we had seen that it was like, I don't know, Christianity today or something like that way back when they had said that the, after big building project, the two people that quit their jobs the most are, were the senior pastor and the tech director. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I remember that. And then the tech director is no surprise because we've run into so many people, so many tech guys. Yeah. Who have quit their jobs after the uh, after the building project is over? So that uh, that wasn't a surprise to see that. I mean, it's, it, it is rough. <laughs> I've done mm -hmm. many building projects, and after yep. every building project I did, there was a moment when I wanted to quit my job. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. actually moments during. It was more during the process that I wanted to quit my yeah. job than after. And all those add up to the point where when you get to the end, you're just ready to punch the clock and call yeah. it a day. Yeah, it's, it is it is tough. Even in the best of circumstances, I think, you know, even in, you know, I was I was blessed, to, you know, all the building projects I did. I had a really good team, not only just in integration, but on my on our staff at our church. We had good people, you know what I mean? So I was it wasn't that I wasn't supported, but it was just. You know, it was, it was rough. <laughs> Building projects are rough. Even in the, yep. even when you have the best things going, um, they're hard. 
Definitely. Well, and I think I think what we've determined or discovered is there's there's kind of some key themes to that, right? There's I mean it's it's work, right? Anytime you're doing a building project, it's a, it's a whole nother set of skills, it's a whole nother set of circumstances, and it's it's like a side job on top of your regular job. But um, but we've determined over the years that there there are definitely some ways to um, sort of help keep your sanity uh, throughout a project, and and certainly you know a lot of it depends on how you start and where you start from and so that's that's what we want to talk and we'll see how long this goes this may end up being multiple 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 parter uh, but uh we just kind of wanted to talk through some of those so um as we've talked about one of the most important things and kind of one of the most sanity things is really starting with your key values for ministry right um, it, it was fascinating. Even just today, I actually had a phone call with um, a church, um, and I've got their their executive pastor and their their tech person, and they're just going, "Yeah, pastor's asking for this," and so they're just they're talking about all these different ideas, and I'm kind of going, "Well, you could do this, you could do this. What's the goal?" And they they finally just said, "You know, I don't think we know what the goal is," <laughs> and it's like. Like this is this is like the core challenge of why I think especially tech people in building projects end up just pulling their hair out and leaving is because there really isn't a key goal for even what the church is trying to accomplish with this whole thing. And we haven't even gotten to the technology side yet. Yeah. Yep. Well, that's that is one of the big stressors, especially on the tech guy. And I think it it spills out into all the people that are involved in it. But if the goals and the, the mission, vision, and values, if that stuff isn't defined really well and everyone has full buy-in on it at the beginning of the project, it is extremely difficult to make everybody happy at the end. And right. oftentimes what we'll see is that the pastor has one version of what he wants the space to be. The tech guy has another version of what he wants it to be. The Maybe the, you know, executive pastor or the board or the congregation or whoever else is a stakeholder in this thing has a third or fourth vision of what they want this space to be. And as all of those parts are pulling on each other, um, nobody really gets what they want. And some mm. people get really unhappy. And I think that's why a lot of times, the, especially the tech guys and uh, pastors tend to leave because at the end of it, they're, they don't really end up with a room or the building that they wanted. And they feel like they weren't valued. They feel like they weren't uh, taken care of and all that stuff. And they did a ton of work and nobody's happy. So, you know, forget it. I'm out of here. Um, so it's extraordinarily important um, to really have a good sit down conversation with all of the stakeholders that are going to, you know, have a say in how the, how the room is used or the building is used and make sure everybody's on the same page with that and make yeah. sure that everybody is, you know, very, very clear on what this room needs to be able to do. Um, once you nail that stuff down, the rest is relatively easy. It's just, you know, choosing the right components to make it happen. But if you're just drawing, you know, if the, the uh, you know, tech guy, for example, wants to do super high level production, um, but nobody else does, then he's not going to get funded to do what he wants. So he's not going to get what he wants and the budget's going to get cut and they're going to get part of it, but it's not going to do anything well. And, you know, it, it just all goes downhill. So nail that stuff down ahead of time and the rest of it gets a lot easier. Yeah. Well, I think so much of know, it's just aligning expectations, right? I mean, just getting everybody on the same page as to what they expect. Um, and, and again, ministry wise, what needs to be accomplished? Um, yeah. I'll, I'll never forget years ago, we did a, um, a project vision meeting, um, at the beginning and, um, you know, there, we got, we got about halfway through and all of a sudden pastor started kind of casting some vision for, uh, multi-site ministry and the fact that they wanted to be able to plant more campuses in a few years and, um, you know, all the things that come with that. And we got through and, and got to a lunch break and we're sitting there with the worship pastor. And he just kind of looks over and goes, I had no idea that we were even thinking about multi-site. It's like, well, that, that sort of changes your perspective on this project, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, how many times have we been in vision meetings and, and, you know, the, somebody will come up to us and say, that's the first, I've been here for 20 years with this same pastor. And this first time I've ever heard that come out of his mouth. 
Mm -hmm. And apparently he said it with enough passion to where they were like, oh, that means so you that's something you really care about. Did not know that. And I've been in hundreds of staff meetings with you. Never Mm -hmm. heard that. You know, I think that's why it's important to have everybody, you know, everybody that has influence. You know, what do we always tell people? Everybody that has influence, not everybody that has an opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, but everybody that has influence on the project needs to be in that meeting where all that stuff is talked about. Um, so that everybody hears the same thing and everybody can right. contribute at the same time, you know, instead of just having all these side conversations and these, all these pre meetings and post meetings and side meetings. And that's, I mean, that's a recipe for disaster on a big, uh, project. Well, that's, that's usually where at the end of a project, people feel like they can't stay anymore because they thought they were going in the right direction. And it turns out everybody's expectations were all over the place. Um, but nobody ever actually talked about it. Nobody communicated it. Um, and and it, it, again, it's even just how you're doing ministry, I haven't even gotten to the technology side of it yet. It's just our expectations for ministry, for this facility, what, what do we care about? Um, you know, who's going to do a lot of the work? You know, a lot of times we get into that conversation too, right? You know, it's like, are you going to be heavy volunteer driven ministry or are you expecting to staff up with very capable professionals as you grow in a new facility or a remodeled facility? And it's like, without even some of those basic questions being answered, and this is all just functional day-to-day ministry stuff, like you're, you are going to let some people down. And at the end of the project, You know, if you were the one who was responsible for stuff and didn't know what the expectations were, you're probably going to be the one who takes the brunt of, of the, the frustration for the results, not being what other people expected. Mm -hmm. And if those, if those expectations aren't both spelled out clearly and realistic, um, you end up with um, a a project that will be at cross purposes. Um, I remember I was in a project years ago where um, really the only thing the lead pastor cared about was from a tech standpoint anyway, was that he could have moving lights. He just really, for some reason, really wanted moving lights. Like that was, that was goal number one, top priority of everything. And as much as I tried, I, you know, I, I knew we needed multiple wireless mics, but at the end of the day, the decision was made to drop wireless mics and go with moving lights. And then when we went to do our first service and we needed four wireless mics and we had two, now suddenly it's my fault that we only have two because we had moving, but we had moving lights. So it was great, but nobody could hear anybody on stage because we didn't have enough wireless mics. So um, being able to spell that kind of stuff out and figure out and, and have those conversations about, you know, especially when budget gets cut, um, that's where that's where having a clearly defined set of values and goals and um, you know way the ways the building is going to be used, spelled out and preferably written down, so that um, we can all point mm-hmm. back to that. Yeah, remember when we had that meeting and we all decided because we have to cut budget, we are going to give up this thing for now because we have to keep this in play because this we have to have. And, you know, once that's all written down, then you can all point back to that and go, oh, yeah, now, yeah, you're, now you're right. We did talk about that. And that, that helps, helps diffuse some of that in the moment frustration that happens when people forget that they made a decision that has ripple effects, but they always forget about the ripple effects. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's, that's why it's most important as Van was mentioning earlier to have all of those kind of key stakeholders in that, in a meeting early on, um, yep. really talking about where it is you guys want to go as a whole, as a ministry. Um, because if, as soon as you don't have certain people in a meeting or you have it, you know, over multiple meetings, but with different people in each meeting, you start to lose the synergy and, and you, you lose the alignment that you at least, I mean, look, you're not going to have a big meeting with 10 people about vision and have everybody a hundred percent agree, but at least everybody has the same information. Um, Mm. and you know, at some point if the leader goes, now I hear, I hear all of you, here's where I want to go. At least everybody heard it the same time, the same place, the same way. And so, um, you know, there, there still may be a little bit of loose translation from person to person, but 
you know, yeah, you can always come back to meeting minutes or, or a recording or whatever and go, well, yeah, but this is what we said we were doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So we've we've got a we've got a good example of that right now with a, a church we're partnering with uh, on the east side of the country who uh, is very much a technology driven church that that's been very important to them and but at the same time they they like everybody you know budget concerns with a, a new building project and um, you know all these various contractors kept coming back going yeah cut the AV do this cut the AV do that you know and of course the church is sitting here going but we're technology driven. We, that's like the one area we can't cut. And they kept saying that. And of course, you know, not everybody heard it. And, <laughs> and so they're ones who had clear vision as to who they are. Um, now, usually they're not the, usually AV is not the highest priority. So uh, that's a fun example. But, you know, there's, there's other churches we've worked with where, you know, having um, ministry space for, for youth, kids, children, all of that is the most important. And so, when cuts get made, they get cut in the main room or in the AV or uh, even in furniture or whatever. And I sit there and go, yeah, you know, a bummer for us as integrators that that happens, but good on them for knowing who they are and where they're going and what's most mm -hmm. important. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, that I think that most of the time, you know, I don't think churches have a clear, I mean, sad to say, but my experience has been that most churches don't really have a clear vision as a, as a staff. Um, the pastor may have that vision. The board may have that vision, you know, however the governance is, you know, laid out at the church. Um, but that the people that are actually running the church every day, week to week, they don't all, they're not always in the know on like the big picture of that. Well, they're not stuff. talking to each other about it. Yeah. Yeah, like maybe and, once a year at the, at the trust fall meeting. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. Well, and there, you know, there's a lot of talk about leadership, you know, I mean, all of us went through that era, the John Maxwell era of pastors who, you know, did nothing but talk about, you know, being good leaders. Um, but unfortunately what happened was we talked about being good leaders, but nobody actually taught people how to be good leaders. They just yeah. talked a lot about being a good leader. Or yeah. people didn't listen. One of the two. I, I probably, probably a little, a little of both. both. <laughs> There's a little of both, but I think it actually, I mean, my experience was it kind of landed more on the leaders that were trying to tell people how to be good lead, that they should be good leaders, didn't really know how to be good leaders. Mm. And so, you know, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't know how to get everybody on the same page. Um, and in a, I mean, to be honest, in a lot of churches, you know, the pastors are getting, they get mired down in the everyday running of the church and they don't have time to like step back and go, okay, what is God telling me to do? What's the vision for the church? What's, you know, because aunt Betty is calling them, you know, 25 times a day and they don't have another person that can take aunt Betty's call or aunt Betty gives a lot of money to the church. So she wants to talk to the pastor. <laughs> He's not going to talk to the other guy, you know? So a lot of times the leaders in church, they don't have any bandwidth to, you know, I mean, how many, we all served in multiple churches and so many times there's like one person, every, every person on staff is doing five jobs, mm -hmm. you know, so yeah. who, who has time to think about, <laughs> you know, where the church is going to be in five years, you know, mm -hmm. they just like, they, you just have to keep everybody's, everybody has to keep the machine oiled. So yeah. it, it definitely is a, I mean, it's definitely something that, that you have to be intentional with for sure. And repetitive. I think that's one uh, one of the other hard things too. Is a lot of times as a leader, you get a vision in your head and you're thinking about it pretty regularly, but you're not communicating it constantly. And you know everybody else gets busy, they move on, and so yeah, they all start to lose sort of track of where you are going in your head. And so, like for for us, when when we start any project, I mean, we're we're going to sit down with all of your your core team, the, the influencers who need to be there. Um, and we want to, even if you guys, even if the church itself is great about communicating, it is on the same page. We still want everybody in the room to, to talk through it and hash it out together. Um, because what we find is a lot of times, even when pastors or, or executive pastors think everybody's on the same page, turns out they're not. And that refresher sets the course for a good, successful 
uh, uh, aligned end results with whatever's going to happen in your project, which at the end of the day For sure. will help you not quit. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I so think next- to that point, I think to that point to wrap it up is that if you are part of it, if you feel like you're part of it and tech people have that problem because most tech people are introverts. They don't, they want to be off in their own. I mean, even me as an extrovert, when I got my office as far away from the main office as I possibly could, that was like a goal. How far away can my office be from the regular office? <laughs> well, when you do that, right? So you can, right? So you can get your work done, right? Because yeah. you, know, you know, not everybody is hitting you up all the time. But the problem with that is you can be very disconnected from, you know, what's yeah. happening. Yeah. So that's piece number one. Piece number two, um, and this is this is a big one that we talk about pretty regularly, um, is before you start looking at shiny objects, um, like I I don't I need an audio system, and I know I want this Yamaha console or this whatever. Right? What are the key values for how technology then? So like you've got a target for ministry. What are the what are the key values for how technology serves? those that target um before you ever think about what console would be cool or what wireless mics would be cool or how many waves plugins i can i can stack onto my audio console um so talk talk a little bit about like some of those values especially the values that you guys think about when we're starting to talk to somebody what are some of the values that you guys are trying to draw out um when it comes to technology and how it serves the ministry as a whole i think one of the first things that i one of the first questions that I ask when I'm talking to a church about this is who is going to be using the equipment and what is their proficiency level? What's their skill set? Because it's all over the place in churches. I mean, I've been in churches where, um, you know, the volunteer audio guys are pro audio guys during the week, you know, and then they go to church on Sunday and, you know, they're, they're, pro audio guys only they're not getting paid because <laughs> they're volunteering. Um, in fact, I've been that pro audio guy as a volunteer. Um, so, you know, that's, that's one level. And then there are other levels where, you know, somebody kind of came in and figured it out by turning knobs and, and pushing faders and pushing buttons and sort of made things work. Um, maybe they had an older analog console and they've kind of figured out, more or less, and they've kind of got an ear and they know what music is supposed to sound like. And they've kind of, you know, brute forced their way through learning how to mix audio, um, but don't have any real training. So, you know, if, um, and where this really comes in as a challenge is a lot of times as a church gets, you know, growing, goes from a, either a plant or maybe they're transitioning from more of a traditional service to more of a contemporary. And so they're trying to go a little more towards production. You know, they'll have some, some volunteers who have been there for a while who don't have a high skill set. They will then hire a tech guy who has maybe a moderate skill set, but really loves a particular console or lighting console or switcher or video switcher or whatever. And, um, you know, they, they will want to come in and bring all their favorite toys in and discover when they do that, that none of their volunteers, A, know how to use it and B, <laughs> really want to learn how to use it. And they are left in the tech booth by themselves <laughs> trying to run an entire service on three disciplines because all their volunteers quit. Um, because they weren't interested in trying to learn that. So, which is not to say you cannot set a digital console down in front of somebody that's only ever mixed on analog and bring them up to speed. You absolutely can. However, you have to be intentional about that and um, you need to know what you're getting yourself into. So, um, and maybe not pick the most complicated one. Yeah, I mean, if you've got if you've got people that have only ever mixed on a, a Mackie, you know, Pro 32, and their <laughs> entire world of sound is a Mackie Pro 32, dropping a Digico SD5 is not going to be the best solution for them. I mean, I love the SD5. If that was if I could mix on that every day, I would mix on that every day. But wrong solution for that <laughs> that volunteer, right? So, yeah. you know, you want to make sure you pick tools that the people that are operating them are going to be able to use. Um, and again, it doesn't mean you have to stick with analog because they only know analog. However, it needs to you need to bring in a system that 
they can learn how to function on proficiently. Um, and, you know, if you've got a tech yeah. person in there that can do some setup and some configuration and build some scene files and snapshots and things like that, that get them a lot closer, they can be successful. And it's the same thing with lighting and it's the same thing with video. Um, you can bring in some more complicated equipment as long as you have the ability to make it easy for your volunteers to use. So that's a really key uh, feature for me as I, as I start thinking about um, system design and what are we going to, you know, recommend to the church for these key components um, to make sure that whoever is using them is going to be, actually be able to use them. Because, you know, I, I, I mean, we've yeah. all talked to churches who have watched their entire volunteer team leave because they did not know how to run a new system, and they either didn't want to take the time to learn or they tried and it failed, and they didn't like getting called out you know, in front of the entire congregation in the middle of the service because something bad happened. <laughs> so, exactly. yeah. Uh, well, don't, if you're, don't... you're going to be volunteer heavy, you've got to set them up for success. Otherwise, you will lose them. Um, right. And putting the right tools in their hands is a huge part of it. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think also, um, you know, I think you need to kind of going back to the what we said you know, at the beginning is, I think you actually have to sit down and say, what do the capabilities of this new system need to be? I mean, what, what does it need to do? What does it absolutely need to do at a baseline? I think there's, what does it need to do? What would we like mm -hmm. it to do? But yeah. you have to define that with everybody in the room. Like what's, you know, cause you may have one person over there that goes, Oh yeah, but, but on Tuesday nights I do that youth study and we do this thing we stream right. it over whatever zoom or whatever. And nobody else knows that except that mm -hmm. one person. Okay. Right. So that's just, right. that's on the list of capabilities that the system needs to do. We need to provide a way to do that to where it's not, you know, we're not, you know, running cables the last minute on, on Tuesday afternoon because nobody thought about it. So yeah, putting, putting together a good list. Cause I mean, that's like when we're doing a project, um, kickoff, that's one of like, when we get into technical side of life, that's the first question. It's like, all right, what's your input list? Like, what's the most inputs you're ever going to throw on a stage? Let's start naming them off. Right. And what are your outputs? What do you actually need? Are they wedges? Are they in-ears? Are they stereo? Are they mono? Are they like, what are they? And it's just super, super practical. But once we get all of that documented, like what's the, what's the highest use case scenario? then we know, look, right now for what you can dream in this new space, you're going to have, you know, 38 inputs and 16 outputs. Well, you don't need a Digico SD5 for that. You can go like, you can go Allen Heath SQ, or if you want to step it up, you can go in and do an Avantis or on the Yamaha side, you can go into, you know, a DM7 or like, there's so many different options out there, but you don't need to go straight for the top of the line, highest capacity if your channel counts are lower. Same thing with lighting. You know, if you're, if you are not going to do a lot of moving lights, you're never going to have haze. You're going to have basic house lights, some stage lights and a little bit of color. You probably don't need a full grand to make lighting console. You're in fact, you're probably just going to confuse the heck out of anybody when all they want to do is turn on some front lights, some top light, pick a color and be done. And so it's the scale. Now, on the flip side of that, if you are going to go big, you, you've got to obviously scale your control systems with that too. Um, a uh, Campsys Quick Queue isn't going to work if you've got you know thirty moving lights in your rig. It's a bad idea. It wasn't designed for that. Um, could it do it? Maybe, but <laughs> you won't like your life. Well, <laughs> be I mean, a lot. Of, I mean, a, you know. <laughs> An ETC Insight can run multiple moving lights, but <laughs> right, you'll want to prick out your eyes right. out with a pencil <laughs> right. while you're doing it. <laughs> right. When you're sizing your system, too, you want to be realistic about it on both sides of it. On the one hand, don't oversize it, um, right? You don't, you don't want to... Um, you don't want to go so big or try to put one piece in there that's so big that it chews up all your budget for everything else. But you also want to be realistic about things too. You know, I, I, I've talked to people who are convinced that they need 96 inputs available on their mixing console. But then when I look at the drawings for their new building, their stage is 12 feet deep and 30 foot wide. Right. And I think, <laughs> no, 
you're there, no, <laughs> there is no way you are ever going to put 96 inputs on that stage. You physically cannot do it. Right. So, um, you know, think, be realistic about what you're doing. And some people will say, well, yeah, but for the future, you know, someday we're going to build a bigger building and we want to take this console over there. Maybe. Um, in all the years that I've been involved in church production and integration and doing building projects and all that, it is so rare that a church will build the temporary building and then and then the real worship facility in enough in a short enough time frame that any of the equipment that they bought for the first one is still right. usable. <laughs> To go into the next one, right? So well, and then uh, and then too, almost always the decision gets made. Well, we still want to use this room. Sure. Right. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, then what are you going to put in here? Yeah. Just, but we might as well just leave this and and yeah. advance the next thing. So yeah. Or people, even if you I, change facilities totally, I'm, we're going to build this 200 seat youth room, and it's like, well, perfect. We have the system for that. Yeah, yep. I think I think I think one of the things in this thing is to oh, to to value engineer things that make sense and not just value engineer things. There's, mm -hmm. there's, there's value engineering and then there's value engineering just for the sake of trying to be cost effective. Cutting budget. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think, yeah, which I think you want to, you know, sometimes I always bristle a little bit. Sometimes people will say, this is a dream session. And it's like, no, 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 no. This is not about just pie in the sky dreaming. This is about, really working through and equipping you for what it is you're trying to accomplish. Like we've already set a target for ministry. Now we've got to figure out what is going to hit that target. Now, if you're going to dream anywhere, um, dream a little bit more on the infrastructure side, uh, pathways and the cap and power and those kinds of things. Because the good news is, is even if you do a, a, an appropriately sized first system, as long as your infrastructure is there, you can always expand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's not as fun, Duke. <laughs> it's it's not today, but in three years when you need it to expand, be. it's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a lot more fun to put in more conduit now than it will be when you don't have enough later. You know, we uh -huh. don't. I mean, you know, we don't have that problem quite as much anymore of of tons and tons of conduit because obviously when we went to networking, a lot of that went away to an extent. But you know, there's nothing worse than having to core. Uh, <laughs> Cora a, a yeah. strip down the middle of the aisle to put in three more conduit, um, you know, in, in a couple of years because you didn't just throw a couple more conduit in there and just yeah. think about it, you know? So there's that. Well, I remember especially, the last especially if after you do that, you see then lands the conduit in the wrong space anyway. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. I don't yeah. think that's ever happened to me, but yes. Well, I remember the last church I was on staff at, I got there and, and at, at one point we were in a meeting and, and they were, the, our video team was kind of lamenting. It's like, yeah, you know, we only, we're only able to get a couple of cameras because we ran out of budget, but we really wish we could move one of our cameras over here. And I'm looking around going, I think we can. And, and sure enough, there was a, a video patch bay and there were inputs everywhere. Like we were using four and turns out there were like 15 different places we could plug cameras in, in that sanctuary. And it's like, man, we can put it wherever we want. I mean, we still only have four cameras, but if we want to move it for the day uh, for an mm -hmm. event or whatever, um, and that infrastructure, I mean, it's just, it's, if they're going to dream anywhere, dream there because that's, it will never be as cost effective to put the conduit and the power and all those things in as when you're building that first building. Mm -hmm. It just won't. Yep. Even so, if you don't put wire in that conduit, you mm -hmm. know, if you did, you were really yeah. trying to save budget and you wanted to have 15 places to put cameras, but you really couldn't quite afford, you know, all the wire pull and the connectors and the plates and the patch bays and all that kind of stuff. Put the conduit in because right. you can always right. go back and do that later. If the conduit's right. there, pulling wire is easy. Um, it's when conduit's not there that it gets very expensive. Well, and even if they don't end up coring the concrete, you know, a lot of buildings now, because it's just, you know, it's just a warehouse, they'll go, well, we'll just go over the top. Well, that's great, but you still have to have electricians go over the top. They, yep. you know, and yeah. and people think they're going to save money by free airing wire, but it, that's, that no. is the, no. the labor to do it unless you do it yourself, um, which most aren't willing to do. Some are, but it still costs you money. You're just, it's it not cost you money. money. Yeah. <laughs> yep, it's it's better. It is always cheaper to to put it in at the beginning than it is yeah. than it is to retrofit it.
for sure. Yeah. The, the last piece to kind of think about with technology uh, on, on the kind of the vision side is thinking about how flexible you need your systems. Like there's a lot of churches we work with um, and, and even my church, like the church I attend, it's the exact same band positions. There's like, there's 10 people that rotate through a band of six every week. There's always three vocals. Like we don't have a lot of flexibility built into our system because we don't need it. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're a church that's doing a lot of creative stuff or doing um, changing up sets on a regular basis, like if you're changing sets on a regular basis and you're lighting on a regular basis, you should have DMX everywhere. I mean, just wherever you can put it, put DMX there because you mm -hmm. may end up meeting it at some point. Um, if you are doing a lot of productions, uh, audio patching at various points, like we did a church a number of years ago where you know they it was a massive stage and sometimes the, the orchestra would be on the left side sometimes it'd be on the right side when they get to production it'd be down in front of the stage and so at that point all we did was uh, we we gave them a, a a networked stage box that followed the orchestra and just put network jacks all the places that it might be and mm -hmm. so you always plug the orchestra mics into the same channels on the box but you just move the box and plugged it into the network. And so mm -hmm. flexibility, depending on how what what kind of stuff you do, how much flexibility you need, that's that's also one of the big things to be thinking about in how your technology can save ser serve you because um, the last thing you want is, you know, technology to be something that costs you a lot of time every time you make a change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just I mean even down to just putting stage boxes where you think you might want stuff ev everywhere yep. even if it's just a network jack that you have a rolling like i remember that church and we just had rolling rios basically mm -hmm. uh in racks and we they could just move them wherever they wanted to and then plug everything in and that was super smart and it worked really well for them and yep. we didn't have to run a ton of copper all over the building it was just right. network yep. jacks that went to a patch bay and and you just plug the plug that patch in and you know into dante and it lit up and you did your thing and you know, you were, you were, you were flexible in that. I think another thing of flexibility too, is that, you know, to have what we do a lot of times is put an easy mode in, um, mm -hmm. for just having a couple of mics, uh, a plug in for a computer, you know, uh, have three, three cues. So the lights come on the stage, you know, and you know, um, you know, women's Bible study, boom, one thing. I think on for smaller mics, churches, that's probably one of the coolest and most important things we end up doing for the five or six events that are in a 300 seat church. And that's the only room they have that can fit more than 40 people. And that mm -hmm. room gets used a ton every week. Yep. So yeah, one of a couple light settings, two wireless mics and a computer on screen, having that be able to run with, without anybody knowing actually how to do anything with technology. That's huge. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yep. The other thing on flexibility too is to be realistic about how much flexibility you actually need. <laughs> you know, yeah. There is that too as well. A lot of times people will come from a building that is very uh, unproduction friendly or you know whether it's a, a mobile setting or a you know a school or a you know hotel or whatever the, the portable setting is. And it's very, very difficult. And so they imagine that they are going to do all these really big and cool things, yet their entire production team is all volunteers that are busy and work full-time jobs and, you know, don't really have time to come in and strike and reset the entire stage right. in a different configuration every single weekend. And so there's this this dream or, you know, and I've, I've talked to churches that like say an LED wall, you know, they might, oh, we want to be able to take the LED wall down and reconfigure it in different shapes and sizes and, you know, configurations and all that. And, you know, I'll, I'll say, well, we can certainly do that. That technology exists, but it's more expensive. Your rigging is a lot more expensive. You've got to put in rigging points to be able to hang it from and, Re are you realistically going to do this one time and go, man, that was a lot of work. Let's never do that again. And then right. you've invested all this money in flexibility that you're never actually going to use. So 
you know, while it's true, you want to be able to do, you want to build in enough flexibility so that the room doesn't fight you and that you can do what you need to do every weekend or most weekends or, you know, at least a couple times a year without a lot of stress. Don't go so far into the flexibility world that, and, and you can also make it incredibly complicated too. If you, you know, I've seen, you know, yeah. buildings with an entire rack full of patching because they put jacks everywhere and the band is, you know, the same six-piece band in the same position every single weekend, and none of the other stuff gets used. And if it ever got unpatched, nobody would know how to put it back together. <laughs> so, right, exactly. you know, be realistic on that, both pro, you know, plus yeah. flexibility and minus flexibility, because you can go, you can go too far in either direction there. For sure, well, it's all got a, it's all got an ROI, right? So, ask the questions. I mean, b before a project, definitely ask the questions again with your entire team there. So that everybody mm -hmm. knows, and and it, it, that's that's one of the nice things about asking a lot of those questions when you have the whole team there, because somebody can go, "Hey, we've talked about doing this once. Do we really care about that?" And mm -hmm. you know, it's like as soon as you start to talk it through and talk about what it's going to cost to do that, a lot of times pastors will just go, "Yeah, it was just an idea. I don't really care." <laughs> cool clarity. I like it. Yep. <laughs> so. Well, very cool. Well, uh, as we suspected, uh, we are out of time. And so uh, this is going to be a, at least a two-parter. So uh, thank you, Mike, our special guest, Mike yeah. Sessler, for joining us on the Insights Podcast. Uh, check us out online, VantageProAV.com. Uh, like us on YouTube. Uh, we've got lots of great content there. Uh, everything from product videos to uh, behind the scenes of projects to this lovely podcast so yep like, uh, and, sub like and subscribe and uh, all like of the subscribe. details for everything that we do is in the show notes below so you can check that out or just go to vantageproav.com and see all the stuff over there all right we'll pick this up in part two all right see you guys later